All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's June 2nd, 2021. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator, and that means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team while showing them the ropes. So if that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format's very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz. Ah! Cloudposse.com slash office hours <laughs> to get started. I just want you guys to take my quiz, I swear. All right, it's cloudposse.com slash office hours uh, to register for these office hours. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to our YouTube channel. If you enjoy our content and want to support it, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. It helps us out a great deal. We'll also follow up with an email that you can share with your team. So with that said, let me kick this off and actually go back. I jumped ahead there. These are my announcements, not those questions. We'll get to those in a second. Um, it's like I've never done this before. So uh, Terraform 0.15, right on queue, 0.15.5 just dropped. Uh, nothing exciting, just a bunch of bug fixes. Um, the other thing is uh, somewhat exciting uh, is uh, uh, Terraform Cloud, which has been somewhat lagging behind in uh, new feature releases did finally come out with an update uh, to the Terraform um, apply interface. And I'll bring that over here. We got some screenshots from that shared uh, earlier here. Let's see where that was. I think it was in the Office Hours channel. Yeah, thanks for posting that, Mohammed. Um, so here's an, a, a, a screenshot of what that looks like. I guess what's nice is that they're aggregating uh, in, in these dropdowns uh, the changes to the resources so you can expand that. And this is a cleaner uh, interface right here. Mohammed, are you on the call? I guess not uh, able to make it today. He's usually on. Um, so yeah, we'll share a link to the announcement. Uh, well, it was already shared there by Mohammed, so check that out. The other announcements that I saw that I wanted to call out was um, yeah, a small one. Uh, a lot of us uh, have seen a Cloud Guru uh, resources around and when Googling how to do stuff, they have actually just been acquired now. Um, so don't know what that means uh, for the future of it, but uh, hopefully it's good, good news. Plural site. I was not aware of a company called Plural Site before, so news to me. All right, uh, other thing announcement I know Matt Gowie was excited for was uh, support for AWS Amplify. Uh, Matt, uh, do you wanna talk a little bit about your experience with Amplify and then what um, the Terraform provider resources will help you do better? Yeah. Um... Amplify is great for shipping simple static sites. I mean, you can use it for a lot of things. It's kind of a, you know, uh, another, you know, you send up code and it's it's similar to, you know, Beanstalk or something that, it, that it'll yeah. build your code for you according to um, some simple configuration. Um, but I was really liking it for simple static sites that I host. And then I had a client who really needed it. So back when this was originally introduced over a year ago, um, I actually built that provider, um, for my client and we had been building it, um, since then, which was, you know, I thought, oh, it's going to get merged soon. It's got tests. It's got people commenting on it. It's got a lot of, um, you know, uh, well involved community around it. People are asking about it all the time. Um, but, uh, the, it never moved forward and now it has finally moved forward. So now it's merged. Amplify resources are in, uh, the main branch and, there's this old, the, the module that um, Eric is looking at is a pretty simple way to deploy um, simple Amplify apps that you know have a, a, a main and a develop branch. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know. I like Amplify, so, but it's, it's not the perfect this, Terraform use case, but it is, it is solid. Yeah. Yeah. 
Vlad, what were you going to Does gonna this add? include the amplify your console things too? Because I, I know there are still a couple of PRs that are being reviewed right now and getting emails. It seems that oh, uh... some amplify parts were merged, but not amplify console, which is the actual static site product thingy. S3 plus uh... 12 from plus a bunch of cool things, basically. That should be uh, amplified. That should be these, um, like an amplify app um, awesome. with a uh, should be the front end, and that's how, like, when you go and create a, an application via the amplify console, it's the same thing. Oh, amplify branch and a bunch of other things are waiting. So those are probably the oh. uh, CI CD for amplify console. Yeah, so okay. there might be some outstanding resources, um, but there's a number of resources that have been merged. Um, I don't know. I haven't awesome, dug into but... it yet. I need to update this for a client. Um, I just got the go ahead to do that, um, for them a few days ago, even before this actually merged and went live. Um, but it, uh, yeah, um, should be cool. Yeah. I see you were following along here too, back in January. I, I think I've commented that same comment <laughs> like five times in five different PRs <laughs> and issues. And yeah. I hate being that guy, but then you got to do it sometimes. Yeah. Um, and you didn't get any thumbs down. Um, <laughs> look at that. No, that's good. Uh, with the static site hosting, I saw that. And, um, is it just that it's, uh, less resources, less intensive to provision it, uh, as opposed to like using the, the combination of like, was it the S3 bucket with website mode and, yeah. um, cloud formation? It's that it gives you um, a, a YAML file to define like tests and to define um, a workflow. And then it gives mm. you integration with GitHub. So it's, mm. you know, you kind of get CI CD out of the box um, mm. and you just point it out a repo and give it a, give it a GitHub uh, access token and then off to the races. And it, and it kind of provides a really quick, it provides preview environments for, for front end sites, um, for PRs, I mean, um, it gives you a bunch That's of nice really things cool. that, yeah. Um, I could see that I was being a fan really of. useful, like with Hugo static sites that uh, we're using like for docs and things like that. Okay. Yeah. The two static sites that I host with it um, are, are purely just HTML. They're like boring. Um, but I have a client who's using it with tons of, you know, uh, front end built uh, like JavaScript um, NPM built sites that they just run NPM build in their pipeline. Uh, and off the races, it just, it just gets Now the going. resources created with the AWS Amplifier, those um, uh, just, are they all masked by Amplify resources or do yeah. you see like buckets in your account and- No, you don't cloud, get any oh, access don't see to any them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so you have to configure everything through Amplify. Um, I think it has okay. its place, you know, it's like, yeah. like anything else. It's, uh, you know, for small, simple things um, or if you're just a front end only shop, um, I have a client who's just a front end only shop and they're, they're stoked on it. So they use yeah. it for like 20 sites. Yeah. That, I, uh, I can say that for me, Amplify console to not totally, but 99% deprecated as three plus cloud front. It's Amplify console is so much easier to set up. You get CACD, you get preview environments. What you lacked, and I don't know if this is accurate. You didn't get all the CloudWatch metrics, which was kind of annoying. But most websites that I used it for didn't actually care that much about that. And I'm using it with Hugo for my personal website. It works great. Again, people should not be using a 3 plus CloudFront because while there are a bunch of modules to configure that, it's still an extra level of effort. You can just offload that to AWS and they handle it for you and you get CI, CD. You don't have to stress about anything. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy when you look at the number of resources provision just to create a simple static site using the other strategies. And um, and uh, AWS Amplify obviously addresses the whole problem of now doing continuous delivery of the Terraform we're going to use to provision AWS Amplify, right? Just kidding. No. So, <laughs> so we offload Atlantis, don't. I still don't. love Atlantis. Okay, okay. I'm not going to go there. All right, so yeah, so then uh, one of the taco providers uh, is uh, required there. Uh, another announcement that was brought to my attention, thanks Joe Hostney, who's been uh, a longtime 
uh, follower of like Judisic and the stuff that Cloud Posse is doing. Um, he had a member of his team knock out one of the feature requests we really wanted for Vendor. So Vendor is a kind of language agnostic tool uh, for vendoring assets from Docker images, from HTTP endpoints, from GitHub repositories. Uh, those are the ones that I think of off the top of my head. It's called Vendor, uh, a play on words there. And it's nice because there's a declarative uh, description of your um, of your uh, dependencies, uh, for example, expressed this way, and you can uh, use it, it. It supports uh, semantic versioning and, and lock file concept, uh, so you can pull in uh, those dependencies. The thing it didn't do, which we really wanted, was the ability to kind of layer in vendoring changes. So we can maybe write a file to a directory that happens to be vendored and it won't try and delete that file. Um, in our case, it's like, we wanna vendor a root module from some external GitHub repo. And we happen to write a uh, backend file to that module once it's been vendored. So we, we, we can uh, save the state in S3. Well, that wasn't really supported by the vendor use case. Uh, and that's why we wanted this feature request. So that is what is now coming out with um, the PR here. Eric, this is uh, Sheldon. I have a hey, question Sheldon. for you. Hey, hey. Um, so I've kind of done a little bit of reading on it, probably from the Go side mostly. Um, and vendoring, it seems, has a reputation as being uh, something that, that that uh, adds like long-term complexities in, in maintenance rather than just uh, continually integrating, uh, you know, from upstream sources and, you know, resolving it that way. Uh, is there some other practice that, that you found that, um, that generally vend vendoring is actually a good practice to, you know, get in your, in your source control project? Well, uh, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah. uh, so the there there yeah there's some things that were, first of all some of the warts that I don't like about vendoring is um, you're committing a lot of code into your source tree and if you're uh, muddling that together with uh, other commits it's you know it makes code review almost impossible if you just added 400 files in 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 one commit. Um, on the other hand, when you're relying, when you don't do vendoring in your source control, uh, you're now relying that the upstream that you're pinning to or pulling in isn't changing or will stay around. So that's the, the risk, the, the contrary risk to not uh, committing whatever you vendor in. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, there's definitely concerns, you know, uh, uh, but it's like, you know, you, know, you know how you avoid those concerns? You just write all the code yourself. Don't, don't rely on any third parties uh, to write your Terraform modules, your Terraform code. Then you don't have to worry about FOMO, about when those things change. Uh, you don't have to upgrade because no one's upgrading it other than when you get around to it uh, as your weekend project. Um, now, when it comes to Terraform modules and vendoring your root modules, like the top level modules, this is a, this is a pattern that I feel like doesn't work the way we all want it to work as engineers. And I think I misrepresented it for a very long time to our customers that you could vendor in root modules for like a reference architecture. And then when you wanted to upgrade your reference architecture, just update the vendor, you know, the, the reference uh, point that you're pointing to. So like Cloud Posse, you know, we release a new version of uh, our reference architecture. And yeah, it's that easy. You just bump the version. <laughs> no, it, it's kind of like uh, you, you build a skyscraper with a massive concrete foundation and, you know, 100 foot pylons deep into the granite crust underneath. And uh, I, we say, oh, you can just change the version and it's just going to go smoothly. And it never does because your root modules are like your... Um, the most opinionated part of your infrastructure. It's kind of what the, defines what you're doing. And there's, you can't, there's Terraform provides no way to do graceful state migrations 
Uh, there's no concept of like an operator to help you do online uh, migrations of resources. Like if you wanted to uh, change the way the EKS cluster works that you could orchestrate in pure Terraform some way to do a seamless migration from one architecture of EKS to another architecture of EKS can't happen. So that's why I've stopped representing to customers that they can truly just upgrade root modules by changing some version that they point to in a remote Git repo. Instead, here's why I like vendoring uh, in this situation. It's a system of record of like when you diverged from some upstream, it helps other developers uh, know where that stuff came from. Your mileage may vary, but you can still try to upgrade it. And some components might be very easy to upgrade this way. I just don't want any false promises that you can vendor everything and it's just gonna miraculously work. So if, so if I was going to summarize, then um, you've kind of opened my mind to thinking about this a little differently. Um, I would say what, I, what I'm observing is that let's say I've got a project and in the case of uh, Go or Terraform, uh, login libraries, things like that, they might not need to be vendored. But let's say that I, I pull in your uh, root uh, module architecture. That is something that I would definitely want to maintain an upstream link to. And um, as, as it stands, that would be manually done inside a, a, a repo by somebody. So instead, yes. vendoring that root module uh, would allow me to pull it in to maintain, uh, pull in diffs, kind of bring changes in and have more control of it, more visibility, while still not vendoring and leveraging you know, the registry or just, you know, get itself yeah. for general modules that, that I didn't really need to track at such a controlled level. Yeah, uh, that's the, everything you said there is true. And I just want to add one thing to that. Okay. And one little caveat, Terraform doesn't support natively pulling remote root modules, right? So, so, so vendoring solves that fundamental lack of Terraform to do that. Um, but everything else you said is still true. Uh, as well. Okay. Um, I also I also say one other thing is that when we were when I started Cloud Posse in 2015, um, and you know the first versions of our reference architecture, we we quickly tried to adopt this whole thing with the remote root modules and pulling that in and everything was super dry and it was great for us as consultants coming in and you know we just drop a few lines of code and wham all the infrastructure comes up and it's all referencing this remote code but when everything is remote and nothing is in your own organization's github repo it's actually pretty tedious to make any change. Well, A is finding out where that code is. You can't just grep your organization's repo. You have to, first of all, go over to Cloud Posse. And then you would want to make some change to like the way your architecture is for like a VPC or something. And then you'd have to get your change upstream to our root module. And then we'd have to make sure that that didn't break backwards compatibility for any other customer using those same root modules. And it, it just added all this complexity and all this risk for other customers when other customers or other people of those root modules were changing them all the time. At the same rate, I don't think there was much benefit to everyone in the community just to absorb every little feature flag or every little addition to some component. So I really like this hybrid model where you, you vendor in the, the root modules and for the most part, you probably diverge and uh, you're kind of jumping off at one point in time. And it's so analogous to the real world. If you think about uh, physical construction and architecture, when they build a building to code, they're building it to the code at that time, like 2021 building code for how to size and, uh, and, and the mixture of the concrete and the curing time and all that stuff. That's based on today's science. And just because that changes two years from now doesn't mean you have to tear up your, your building uh, because the building code changed. Um, and that's how I think about now root modules and Terraform. Oh, sorry, a quick question about this, uh, uh, this uh, YAML file. It's a, it's a um, Kubernetes uh, uh, API. Uh, no, I, I, how does it fit in the yeah. Terraform? I 
just thought it'd be no, confusing. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, great observation. I like that you pointed it out. So um, there are two camps of people, first of all. More and more I'm seeing rifts in, in like the config space. One is like, stop giving me YAML. I don't want to see any more YAML. And the other is like, I just give me, you know, code, a DSL, and I want to write code. All right. So if you're in the in the in the camp that still likes using YAML, I, which Glad Posse is, and I like, and I think it's a necessary evil. Uh, then I think that the YAML specification uh, that Kubernetes uses is a great one. It, it it it's extensible, and you can adopt it in your own tooling. You don't have to use it with Kubernetes. Now, I will say that VMware Tanzu is a division of VMware are focused on like a uh, Kubernetes distribution. So they take a very Kubernetes centric approach. And I wouldn't be surprised if there is a vendor operator out there, but vendor is first and foremost a CLI. And they're just using a Kubernetes like syntax for the YAML. And uh, it, it also inspired kind of uh, what we do for Cloud Posse um, we have our Terraform YAML stack config, and it is not following the Terraform, the Kubernetes spec yet, but I really wanted to. It, it, it was accidental that it wasn't. It, we just had to rush some other things out when we started. We didn't add it. But I want it, I want it to reflect very, sim very much uh, what it looks like uh, in the, did I lose my, ah, shoot, I didn't mean to go away from it. the YAML specification there. Oh yeah, here. Yeah, so uh, you know, having an API version for your YAML config is great because you don't, you wanna be able to, from your parser, be able to identify if this is a supported config. Um, uh, being able to have different kinds of config files, it's really nice to be able to define that. And then everything else here is arbitrary. Uh, you know, this is, this can be whatever you want. It, they call it directories, but if you're coming up with your own schema, you, you can choose what you want. So all Cloud Posse needs to do is add to our stack configuration these two fields, and then we're more or less running a a, uh, a custom resource. So did that make sense? Uh, yes, thanks. So this is CRD, right? So um... well, well, the, 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 well, so uh, so a CRD is a definition of a custom resource. And this here is an example of a custom resource called config. And uh, there is actually, I mean, you can, we use vendor as a CLI. It's literally distributed as a binary. You can download the binary uh, as an asset from an asset here on the, uh, the, the GitHub repo here and run it locally. And you just pass it the arguments. Sorry, my son's here. Um, you can just pass it the arguments uh, with the path to that config file and it'll vendor everything in for you. Got it, thanks. Um, also another to uh, promote, you know, Cloud Posse's tooling. You know, we do have our packages repository, github.com slash Cloud Posse slash packages. And we distribute this as Alpine packages, Debian packages, RPM packages. And it's all the tools that we depend on, everything from you know, Argo CD to AWS Vault and Chamber. And we have vendor in here too. What's cool about what we do with our uh, packages distribution is we distribute multiple versions of a package. So you can install them concurrently and then use dpackage alternatives to select which, uh, which one you wanna use so you can have them all installed at the same time in your Docker images. All right, uh, any more questions on vendor and why we're excited about that patch? Cool, then just a couple other things that were came across my radar. These didn't happen in just in the past week, but they were, I think uh, the deprecation of pod security policies was brought up on a recent office hours. And then I did see that on the Kubernetes uh, blog. The gist of it was that, uh, yeah, they just realized that it wasn't the best uh, interface for defining the security policies and it was confusing to anyone who ever had to try and do it, uh, especially since they applied specifically to pods. And there, there are better alternatives now, for example, using uh, Gatekeeper uh, based on uh, Open Policy Agent, uh, 
right, which is a more popular pattern right now. So just a heads up on that. The other one was uh, graceful shutdown of nodes in Kubernetes. And I really like this uh, so that we can have you know, less disruptive auto scaling events. Uh, it's especially nice if you're using EKS with spot instances and you want a graceful shutdown there um, or scaling down for uh, any other reason. And the other one is suspended jobs. So I thought this was interesting reading over. It's a little bit uh, manual in the sense that you can now, uh, you know, it, Kubernetes job has this concept of completions, number of times it should iterate before stopping. And uh, you might have, you know, in a map produce type situation, you might, you know, have a thousand uh, iterations that you're gonna run uh, through this or 10,000 iterations of this job you're gonna run. But you might also want to be able to suspend actively running jobs if you're short of resources or for some other reasons. Like you're, you need to do a migration or something uh, of the, the workloads to a new node pool or cluster. You can suspend the uh, jobs now and it'll keep its place and you can then unsuspend it when you want to at another time. Now, the act of suspending and unsuspending is literally modifying the custom resource, or sorry, not the custom resource, but the job resource uh, and toggling the sus suspend attribute to true or false. Uh, and you get that behavior. So your tooling for how you do that, whether it be Argo or Helm or whatnot, uh, will be responsible for that. All right, and that was those were my three announcements. Anybody else have any cool announcements they've picked up or read uh, this past week? The Kubernetes graceful node shutdown will be a big deal for AMI updates. Those are still a mm. tiny bit annoying slash manual slash you have to do some something to uh, before rolling the node, which is not ideal. It's been getting better. AWS built, I don't know, a tool that handled a bunch of those, but it wasn't still as ideal as it could have been. So I'm very excited for that one, especially because I think beta features are available on most cloud providers. But it's going to be a while until 1.22 is this, 23 is available in yeah. the US. Another yeah. big deal is ECS everywhere. It went GA. Mm. It went preview at GA instantly, and I love that. And the That's service really is very interesting. interesting. For people that aren't familiar with it, uh, you can basically run containers in your data center or Raspberry Pi and have them be managed by ECS. That's a really, really, really awesome thing for folks that have a data center and don't want to spend, I don't know, a couple million on AWS Outposts. You can just get a tiny outpost put SQS on it or SNS or whatever, and then still use all the servers you have in your own data center uh, for AWS things. And they're managed from AWS, they're skilled, they get an IAM role, it's awesome. But it is still dependent on the ECS uh, control plane managed by Amazon, right? Yeah. I it mean, doesn't bring your control plane uh, on-prem. No, it still has to connect back in region. It can okay. handle uh, network disruptions. Like if you have a, I don't know, 10 second disruption or a couple of minutes, it's not going to be the end of the world. But if you cannot connect to AWS for five hours, obviously no workloads are going to start. Nothing is going to happen. Similar to how worker nodes in Kubernetes react when they cannot connect to the control plane. Yeah, that makes sense. At first, I was thinking, oh, wait, this is almost like uh, uh, net now ECS is almost like uh, Kubernetes or Nomad where you can self-host it, but it's not that. It's uh, very different. It's like it's more like the GitHub action where you self-hosted runners. <laughs> uh, so you can have self-hosted uh, ECS now in your data center. All right. Uh, that's cool. And any other cool announcements? Yeah, I think I just saw a provider, a telephone provider to apply to a job. So you create a resource called uh, the company name application, and then you specify arguments as your phone number, email, LinkedIn, GitHub, and your oh. homepage. 
and then your anti-reform init, anti-reform apply, and your application is submitted. How how cool is that, guys? How cool is that? <laughs> That's a pretty uh, cool application process. Yeah, when you said uh, Terraform provider uh, to submit a job uh, or apply a job, I was th I was kind of excited. Like, oh wait, we can now run ECS tasks from Terraform, and uh, I was a little bit sad, but I, I still think it's cool. Uh, can you share that, Mohammed? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll do. Also, you weren't on earlier. Uh, I talked briefly about your announcement there. You, you pointed out that um, uh, Terraform Cloud added the updated UI for applies and plans. Yeah, still UI enhancements, but what can I say? We will wait, guys, we will wait. <laughs> Are you using it daily? In yeah, your, for small, uh, medium businesses, yeah, I did. I, 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 okay. Cool. Uh, let's see here. I want to open up that link that uh, Mohammed. Oh, uh, can you share that link in Office Hours? Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I wonder. I wonder what uh, what the result will be uh, of candidates that try and do that. What is that exactly? Uh, well, I'm just going to tag uh, Andy Miguel on our team. Um, so it, it's a way for you to. It's a way for people to apply to your job postings uh, by creating a Terraform resource uh, with their information, <laughs> and it submits it to your API. Now, is it gimmicky? Hells yeah. But it, what, what I kind of like about it is it filters out a lot of just uh, cruft out there, somebody who can't figure out how to use the custom provider. Uh, you can maybe augment this with some other uh, requirements. And, it, you know, it, it, and it's a fun experience, I would guess, as an applicant to try and apply to a job that you really want uh, in an unconventional way. But yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, what, what are some augmentations to this we could add? Uh, going back to the long running theme of interview questions for DevOps, how could we make this more more challenging? Using a data resource to get the list of available jobs. Yeah. And the GitHub should be the repo of your code for this submission. You could use the Terraform Domino's provider to have pizza while you do your interview. <laughs> <laughs> instead of allowing, uh, instead of allowing the uh, LinkedIn, GitHub, and homepage attributes as part of the application, uh, you could provide all those as data attributes and make them do a for each on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually thinking here, like if I, if you have like maybe an assessment as a given to you. Can you use this provider to submit it to the company instead of actually sending a mail back? Yeah, exactly. If I submit my, exactly, I want to be able to get my uh, approval, my response, my uh, compensation back as a response. <laughs> it's creating the resource. No. Yeah. That's an output of the resource. Is An output yeah, of the resource, if yeah. If you're passed or not. Yeah. And all the the hard part is in the provider actually and makes it a hard thing for the the company to develop but that'd be funny that would be cool uh any other uh, fun projects you guys have seen or uh, announcements uh there's there's one that uh Maybe it's been mentioned on a prior call, um, but I've been uh, very interested in how things are going on it called Leap. Has anybody been using that? How is it spelled? L-E-A-P-P. -P. It's uh, I I've been an AWS Vault fan in the past, but there is a problem with uh, AWS Vault, in my opinion, that it's just, it's not super accessible. It does take a little while. You got to work through it. And it's not something that you just hand over to, uh, a development team and everybody just intuitively gets it uh, requires a lot more work. 
uh, Leap is actually really interesting and they're kind of in the early phases. So they've been really responsive and dialoguing on, on this product. And, you know, they're, they're building out basically uh, something similar to how AWS Vault works that generates uh, temporary mm -hmm. uh, credentials for you. But what I really like about it is, as you can see, they have like a little desktop cross-platform app. So if you are using, say, AWS uh, SSO, for example, on uh, the role that I started last month, I just did a single sign-on. Instantly, my SSO portal for all 12 different accounts were instantly available. And then as soon as I wanted to switch to a new account, all I did was click on it, and it replaced the credentials uh, file contents with the temporary credentials, and it rotates those automatically as I'm working. So it's a really interesting concept for not not necessarily for CI, but for simplifying account switching from a development point of view on your system and making it very yeah. user friendly, uh, as well as handling the multi-factor authentication pop up and you know single sign on. I've really enjoyed the experience, and I think it's got a very good promise to uh, you know improving a development workflow with using temporary credentials, but not really making it obvious that you're having to deal with all those pain points. Yeah, I know it's been incredibly painful for us um, working with customers, giving them this very simple SSO workflow, at least with AWS. I, my yes. guess is GCP is a whole lot easier and prettier, but uh, yeah, and this, this unifies this works it, great. That's also nice. This, yeah, this works mm -hmm. great with Azure, uh, with Azure and AWS. And um, if you take a look at their GitHub issues, like I had a discussion for a little bit with uh, one of their devs. Uh, talking to him about the process field inside the config that allows you mm -hmm. to inject process credentials without needing to replace the credential file object. Um, they're they're very responsive about that. Taking a look at improving uh, options to uh, what was it to not only do the single sign on manually add entries, but also um, potentially add a browser connection like AWS Vault as where you can just click on account and say open con open management console. Uh, and then there's one other nice plus in this that that out of the gate, I thought was pretty nice. Um, when you do assume a role in an account, uh, they've got the little green box on the dialogue that you can see and it actually opens up uh, an option to enter into SSM sessions. And mm. right now it will list out all the instances in the region that you chose and you can hit, sit, hit uh, yeah. Enter SSM session and it launches your terminal with the AWS CLI pre preset, you know, to the instance ID to open a new uh, SSM session. So, yeah, lots of little things that they're trying to add uh, and improve. So, I definitely yeah. would recommend if you guys don't have a great tool for that, take a look at it and then definitely give them feedback because they're they're trying to improve this process for everybody. Yeah. And just one thing to point out because when I first saw this, I thought it was another SaaS solution or whatnot, but it's actually an open source project. So this is. Uh, free, right? To get started yep. with. Yeah, desktop That's tool. Cool. Yeah. I think they'll they'll eventually. I'm sure they'll have to monetize somehow with like some extra features yeah. for teams. But as it stands right now, it's fully free. It's open source, and like I said, out of the gate, um, you know, there's been a couple issues here and there. There, I'm I'm okay with that, considering it's in like you know beta or early access. Uh, but they've been very responsive. They even have auto update now. So like the pain of having to update when they're continually improving it. It's just restart and it's it's okay. done. Like they're, they're doing a really good job about trying to make it as seamless as they can. So I, I'm a little bit confused. So it, it's like an open core product or it's basically, it's open source, but they, I mean, I guess I'm just interest, interested from a security perspective. It's a lot easier to sell, sell, I mean, as in promote to customers or uh, clients if, if this is just fully open source and they can just download it from GitHub and run it versus if there's a SaaS component where, you know, they have to then trust uh, whoever, you know, leap.cloud is. Yeah, I think that's just their website right now. I don't think there is anything related to SaaS. Um, right now, I believe okay. it's, uh, they, they've, been, they've been improving their core logic to kind of separate things out to allow CLI usage as mm -hmm. well as GUI. Um, but right now, when you when you install it, it's basically from what I what I've gathered in the discussions with the devs, it's like a uh, a long running service uh, on your machine, and as you're working, uh, you know you say take prod account or QA account, you click on it, you know single sign on into it, and it generates a at this time like a 20 minute SSO uh, session, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and then it's rotating your credential files um, yeah. automatically every 20 minutes behind the scenes without you really doing anything uh, until you deactivate it. So it's all just like local uh, services using you know the AWS SDK. That's really Any cool. idea how this compares to teleport? It sounds pretty familiar, but I don't know if I'm missing something or not. Well, you mean gravitational teleport? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a massively more complex project and product uh, that is not run locally as a client. I mean, teleport is installed server side. Uh, it has a hub and spoke model. There's a teleport server, auth servers, proxy servers, trust the uh, trusted certificate chains. Uh, it's really- Oh, it's so a, this is just locally and for AWS. Yeah, well, it looks like it supports Azure here. I see that oh, Azure. And logo. Azure, okay. And, yeah. Got it. I, um, and I, I, you know what it makes me think of, Vlad, is a little bit like, um, geez, what was, was that really nice little IDE for Kubernetes you run locally? Lens. Lens, lens yeah. yeah, yeah. This, right. this, this makes me think of Lens kind of in the sense that it's also open core. Well, and now it is, and uh, is for Kubernetes. Is that for a single sign-on with, um, looks like uh, G Suite to AWS, Okta to AWS, one login to AWS, G Suite to Azure, but no, uh, okay, okay, and it does support GCP. Yeah, so just to, just to say where this, the use case that this helped me with is, it's a dev tool. Um, I mean, you could do it for non-development if you have roles that you want people to access tools. Um, but it, it simplifies things because, you know, I used AWS Vault and I spent hours and hours and hours wrestling with that. I also spent hours wrestling with it because I jumped between Bash and PowerShell. And so some of the, the examples and tooling is all built, built around um, like a Bash interpreter when you ex export environment variables. There's, there's a lot of gotchas when you're trying to use it. Um, when you say log into your console, it's a short-lived um, SSO session or S, it's a sts token that's short-lived and as a result like i would constantly have my browser or my tooling say oh expired you know you need to relaunch it again what i found for me is that this solve well while it doesn't have yet the cli component to it it solved the the pain point where like three days into a new job when i just signed into my sso i shipped code because i didn't have to add more complexity and more uh working through things, adding more profiles. I just automatically loaded my SSO profiles. I clicked on it, popped up, you know, entered my multi-factor authentication. And then from that point on for eight hours, it's rotating those credentials for me during the day until, you know, my, my maximum session time is hit. And then I would have to sign in again. So for me, simplification, so I could focus on other things that were more complicated instead of wrestling with my credentials file and tooling. I found that that was a really good experience and why I would say if, if you don't have something that's super slick and making that process great and you got to jump between accounts, I found yeah. it to be a great experience. Plus it has Linux support, Mac support, Windows support. Um, so the major operating system. So that's cool. Do you know, Sheldon, um, you, you know how you're saying it can automatically uh, work with session manager and drop you into node or uh, drop you into a shell. Uh, can you control the command that it runs? At this time, I do not believe so. I believe it launches uh, a preset command, which is the AWS SSM start session dash dash target. Okay. The way that I use it, because um, you can do named profiles and all of that, I use it in a very simple fashion where uh, everything is just set up to default. So yeah. when I when I inherit the role, I just I never have to like specify profile names or anything. I just activate whatever profile and account I want to be in. And then I never mention profile names as I'm working. That's why I don't need to customize the commands. Um, but you can set up named uh, profiles. And then I imagine that at that point, the at least the, the SSM command that you launch should be pulling in that name. I haven't tested that out, but I imagine. Because uh, I imagine you could see where I'm going here. Uh, I would love it just to be able. I would love this as the front end to geodesic. So then, 
I click one of these sessions here and it just launches a Docker shell. Uh, it calls it calls a custom command that I give it, which would be uh, uh, starting up the GD6 Docker image and you'll be logged into that session automatically. Um, I think that I think that would be great. And I would recommend based on having a discussion for 40 minutes yeah. with their dev and the fact that it's a very small team that yeah. is really looking for feedback. They have a Slack community and everything. I'll try and put you in touch with them. And that type of feedback would probably be fantastic to put on the roadmap and just let them know that's the type of feature set that somebody in your role would look for. Definitely think yeah. that they could, they could, uh, you know, improve on that. Yeah. I think that'd be cool. Like, look, even like this animated GIF here, right here. So if I click on that and on the right, it's just my GD6 shell with my tool chain and everything ready to go. Yeah. That would be rad and signed in to uh, AWS. Okay. Uh, let's see. So getting back onto the agenda, I just had one, uh, or two, yeah, two things I wanted to talk about in the remaining time. One is, um, Matt brought this up and I remembered looking at this a while ago, but the pattern has kind of come back to me and I kind of like it more and more as I think about it. So with one of our customers, we've deployed the, uh, SOPS, uh, operator. Uh, for Kubernetes. And what's really nice about this SOPS operator is that you can uh, commit a, a, an encrypted uh, custom resource that's encrypted with a KMS key. And that KMS key is protected with your IAM credentials so that you're still using the whole IAM uh, paradigm that you've established uh, to manage your encrypted secrets that are committed to Git. And what's nice about this, uh, as opposed to like Git's crypt secrets or the other things is in those other models, you still have to manage the encryption key. And you have to make sure that things don't get accidentally uh, decrypted and committed to source control. Um, I love this pattern where the KMS key is used. Now, uh, with Terraform, we have this similar problem, right? Uh, that uh, everyone knows about right? that. You can read your encrypted secret from SSM and you can use that to provision this resource over here. And in the process, your, your, that, uh, that, uh, that secret value uh, is stored in the Terraform state um, as, part, as a result of that transitive process. So how do we get around that? Uh, so it doesn't need to be in the Terraform state. And it sounds like, uh, Matt, you're saying that you can accomplish something like that using the uh, SOPS provider. Oh, I don't know uh, if you can get files. it out of your Terraform state. Oh, um, okay. I mean, okay. no, there's no, you know, Terraform yeah. state is Terraform state. It's never, yeah. Good. yeah. you're never going to get your secrets out of that. I, I never even try, but it, I, yeah. I think that, um, I forget, let me look at that thread real quick. Um, but I remember, uh, you know, they were looking for an integration so that they could um, have Amplify pull values from Parameter Store or Secret Manager. Um, and they were talking about committing some tokens to source. It was Michael uh, who actually opened up the Amplify issue. Um, mm. You know, committing the, you know, secrets to source um, is, you know, you don't need to do that if you, I mean, you're, you're committing secrets to source, but they're encrypted. So I think that's yeah. the what I was suggesting for him. It's but okay. in regards to getting them out of your Terraform state file, I, I don't think Yeah, but, well, but, but what's the difference though? Like if you just use uh, the SSM uh, resource, a uh, data source and uh, read the secret from SSM and then provision the... Um, Only that uh, it's not GitOps. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't enough. think it's, it's all, sorry. Yes. I think I was just uh, referring to his point about, you know, committing some tokens to source. Um, yeah where it seemed like he didn't, maybe he didn't know about SOPs and the fact that you can encrypt your, you know, secrets at, if you're committing them to yeah. source. So I figured I mentioned it, but. Um, okay, that makes sense. And do you know yeah. if this uh, provider uh, unrelated, well, related, but unrelated, I was just curious if it also supports, um, like, or uh, do you know how the provider works? Is it under the hood? Is it using just the SOPs CLI? I believe it is. Um, uh, or or okay. SOPs is now written in, um, in Go, like they transitioned yeah. from some other Python or something like that to Go. So I think it's using the SOPS um, actual Golang code, like calling out to the 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 SOPS. Uh, I don't know, we call that an SDK in Golang. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it under the, the, 
I'm pretty sure that's the case. It's the it's the SOPS uh, Go library. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, so so then it probably supports the full feature set of SOPS. Uh, I'm just curious, like if this will work with uh, KMS just as much as the uh, SOPS operator would work with KMS. The um, yeah, it, it it works with KMS. Um, the only thing that it doesn't do is it will not write out a new SOPS file for you, which I actually have some use cases for, and there's an issue open about. Um, but I don't believe Carl, who's the um, maintainer, was interested in implementing that, um, or it was like it's something really he... funky writing anything in Terraform in terms of a file. Uh, and then what you're going to get is people writing uh, something to a file and then trying to read from that file in the same Terraform uh, module. And that never works uh -huh. because yeah. of uh, the, how, how deterministic the state needs to be. And it's pre it's done as part of the plan. And yeah, that makes sense. Okay. That's interesting. And uh, then yeah, and then the next uh, thing to talk about uh, would be like a good check-in uh, with Leia here, who was curious, um, the state of our reference architecture. So if you if you go to Cloud Posse uh, or you go to docs.cloudposse.com, um, here's the state of our reference architecture in terms of getting started. Um, but there's But there's not a straight line from A to Z. So, under the docs, we introduce um, all uh, you know the concepts uh, and what we're doing, our terminology, our philosophy to why things work the way they work. Uh, we talk about components, uh, stacks, uh, catalogs, and you know the other terminology like our Docker-based toolbox uh, approach. And then we have some tutorials written by yours truly here, Matt Dowie. Um, one is uh, getting started with UDSIC and how to do that. Uh, very easy to, to start. Then getting started with Atmos. So Atmos is one of our many tools uh, as part of the tool chain. Atmos is a way to kind of define your configuration uh, of your entire environment in YAML and then provision it uh, on the command line um, with Terraform. And the, the next one is a more involved example showing you how you can tie all the pieces together between GeoDesic, Atmos, the stack configurations, and uh, Terraform root modules. Now, the, the, real, like, the real meat of it is under uh, GitHub Cloud Posse Terraform AWS components. And uh, these components, uh, ha we have lots of pull requests here open where we're upstreaming components, but we unfortunately just haven't gotten around to uh, doing our own internal code reviews and merging these components. And I wouldn't say our components right now are internally congruent, meaning they are coming from different versions of our reference architecture from different customers at different points along the way. So they don't just automatically plug into each other. And this ties in a little bit to what I was telling uh, everyone earlier about vendor. Like in an ideal world, everything for root modules could just be vendored in to all of our customers. But then every customer is at the mercy of what we're doing with our reference architecture publicly here. So I really, right now, am treating our AWS components uh, repository as a, I don't know what, what the term is, as a way for us just to exchange the information for folks who are handy enough to get started and can do this on their own. We're gonna save you a, a world of hurt. Uh, we have uh, all of our uh, modules here, uh, root modules for how we do our account architectures with, with um, organizational units and service control policies and managing account settings and our, how we do our Datadog implementation, our CloudTrail implementation, EFS, ECR, EKS, et cetera, et cetera. And then even more that are all here that haven't been yet uh, merged in, including stuff for uh, AWS WAF. Um, we have our Spacelift uh, root module for how we uh, use Spacelift to manage with, uh, continuous delivery of Terraform. So if um, it's not for the faint of heart, but if you're a accomplished Terraform user, this stuff will make a lot of sense to you. And if you like what we do and want to see how we do it, check it out. 
All right, we got eesh, four minutes left before we end off uh, end the hour. Any other quick questions? I guess I, I had one quick question. Yeah, go for it, Mark. Um, I'm sort of in the process of road mapping a little bit what you just uh, were discussing, the, um, the idea that there are different modules that are kind of in different states. And one of the things that I found that often helps me a lot is to uh, look at the upstream branches and uh, you know try to find uh, branches that are more or less compatible with the, the latest uh, modules that are in use. I, I don't know if that helps anybody or not, but. Yeah, we, I mean, I think that'll make sense uh, for some things for our AWS components. We are just, well, I'll tell you the, the honest truth why AWS components is there is that for our customers, uh, uh, we always say, hey, if you want the latest version of our components, uh, even if they're not you know, uh, paying us right now or we're on retainer, I'm happy to upstream uh, those components that we have. So we're upstreaming a lot of these components. And then I just uh, tell the customer, hey, uh, go check out this repo and pull down the latest thing. So that's why they're, they're in a various state of um, evolution. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. One um, of like, yeah, go on, sorry. I, I was just going to say that's um, that's kind of been my learning ground. That's been the place where oh, cool. <laughs> the most, uh, most rubber hits the road there. It is. It is. And I, I, I've heard from some people. I mean, I, it's really exciting to see the number of people I see. And we have a, a channel called uh, Judy Sick and Sweet Ops. And um, other people have been DMing me or emailing me. And it's exciting to see the organic growth that's just been happening of people using uh, our components and our tools, even though we, it hasn't been a priority right now for us to document end to end how to do this stuff. So I guess that's just his way of saying it works if you with enough elbow grease. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, with that said, we're at the top of the hour here or uh, top of the hour for the scheduled uh, session. Uh, so let's leave it at that. Uh, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, I encourage you to head over to youtube.com slash C slash cloud posse. And you can find all of our past office hour sessions uh, with some show notes, as well as our cloud posse explain series, which are outtakes from our office hours. Uh, we have a special playlist called cloud posse explains and you'll see that those videos are like five to 10 minutes and it's a great way to get up to speed quickly on uh, some of uh, the way we think about uh, DevOps and infrastructure. Uh, other things you can check out if you're new to the club here, uh, go to slack.cloudposse.com, subscribe to our uh, Slack team. We got nearly 4,000 active members there. We have our newsletter. Uh, we have, um, what else? We got uh, our podcast, which is just a syndication of our office hours. You can listen to it wherever you listen to podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, et cetera. Go to podcast.cloudposse.com. Also, I love connecting with our community on LinkedIn. So head over to linkedin.com slash in slash Osterman. You can find me there. Uh, and uh, yeah, look forward to getting to know everyone here and see you all next week. Same place, same time. Take care. Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.